Uh, but we're going to go ahead and get started. I am delighted to welcome all of y'all to class tonight. Uh, we are really excited uh, to be jumping into this book. And uh, one of the things about what we're doing is we're spending a lot of time on context to begin with. I know some of you are thinking, how can we be on our third class and we haven't even cracked the book yet? Uh, but there is uh, some method to the madness here, and we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. But I'd like to go ahead and have us begin with a word of prayer. If you would please bow your heads, let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of this time together tonight. I thank you for each and every person choosing to spend an hour of their day uh, together as we look at this book that seeks to tell us about what it means to follow Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to bless our time together. Uh, that you Honey? Okay. All right, I'm trying to get Brian to be able to have um, sound again. I I muted everybody and I think it included him. If y'all can hear me, thumbs up. So. Okay. <laughs> Kane, what you need to do is yeah. Brian has to unmute himself. You cannot unmute him once you've muted everybody. He has to do it himself. Oh, okay. All right. Um, but, and the best thing to do is rather than mute everyone is just individually mute people. Oh, Call him on the phone. Okay. I will try to do that. We'll see if it works. So. Um, I don't know if he'll pay attention to his phone, but um, well, I just <laughs> unmuted myself. Oh, there yes. you go. Okay, yeah. sorry. So I tried to mute everyone, and I muted you too. So Chloe's. <laughs> so. Okay. I well, I th think I seem to have fixed that. So uh, right. that's good. Uh, so let me welcome everyone again. Say we are very glad you're here. We're grateful for this technology, although it is a little bit crazy. <laughs> uh, sometimes it doesn't always do what you want it to. And we are uh, going to be starting as usual with our theme verse, uh, which is all about grace and peace being multiplied in your life as you lean into knowing God and knowing Jesus. And we talked about this word for know, epignosis here is a really strong word. It's deep relational knowledge. And uh, I think that's a great goal for all of us. So let's uh, join in saying this verse together. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. And every time I read this, I want to preach a sermon on it, which I'm not going to do tonight, but just suffice to say that this is a passage that will richly reward meditation on it. So I would encourage you uh, in some of your spare time um, to look at this verse and to just chew on it. And we will uh, be coming back to that verse from time to time. So as we've said before, but uh, as something that's important for those of you who are new to this class, uh, there are several ways you can approach this class. And I'm perfectly happy with any of them, whatever you would like to do. Um, this is Liberty Hall as far as that is concerned. So if you wanna be on the beach, basically what that means is you show up uh, on weeks that you feel like showing up and you listen or not, uh, or nap or whatever you'd like to do, you're just kind of here and we're delighted to have you. Or you can snorkel. Snorkel means that you are here and every now and then you see something that's really interesting. And so you may want to investigate some of the resources that I'll talk about in that one subject area. Or you can scuba dive. Scuba diving uh, means going whole hog uh, with all of the different resources that there are. Uh, we're gonna have some 
articles and recommended books and other mm -hmm. things as we go along the way. Um, that if you are as much of a nerd as I am about these things, you will thoroughly enjoy going down the rabbit hole with those things, uh, but that is not required. So whatever level of that you would like is great. Uh, I also wanna encourage you, if you're gonna follow the class, uh, to shoot me an email. You can find uh, me on the St. Philip's Church Charleston website. Just shoot me an email and ask to be added to the distribution list and then you'll get summaries and links and all of those kinds of things. The other thing I'd like to ask you to do, if you're a podcast listener, we've just put this class up on Apple Podcasts, but it's hard to find uh, because until there are reviews and ratings, uh, it doesn't pop up as much. So if you like the class, or even if you don't like it, if you wanna put a bad review, you could do that too. Uh, I think any reviews are better than no reviews. Uh, but that will help other people to find the podcast. So uh, a couple of things just about how to read Mere Christianity, which I assure you, we are actually going to do that at some point. We're not going to spend forever in prep time, uh, but we are going to read the book. And when we do, I want to encourage you to read it out loud one chapter at a time. Because the book uh, started off as the broadcast talks, uh, which we've talked about at some length the past two weeks. Uh, it's designed for that pace of reading and it's designed originally for a chapter a week. So the idea is that you would hear it and then you would mull over the ideas and think about them. The first time I read this book, I sat down and tried to read the whole thing in one sitting and I thought my head was gonna explode and I didn't really like it or appreciate it. So I would commend to you um, to take it slowly. Um, the other thing is that a great aid in this book is something that is called the C.S. Lewis Doodle. And that is on YouTube. It's a YouTube channel. Uh, and it's a great resource as well. So I would commend those things to you. So as we get ready to review context, I, I just want to mention to those of you who are okay. new that a really easy way to catch up if you've missed the first couple of classes is to go to St. Philip's YouTube channel and you can actually watch the video of the Zoom class where the PowerPoint will come up. Um, so that will be uh, a good thing for those of you that have missed. So I wanna just encourage you in case you have accidentally uh, unmuted yourself, uh, make sure that you are muted uh, because we are gonna do our little name that tune exercise uh, that I hope you will be able to hear this week. And every week we'll have a little bit of music uh, that has some connection to what we're talking about. So uh, the idea is to try to figure out what it is and figure out uh, what the connection might be. So here we go. Well, we might be going. Tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow, we gave our today. The festival organist once again this year, Peter Crompton, organist emeritus of the Royal Hospital School Holbrook. Is there any ideas what this is? You might send them in the chat. Sounds like celebration music from uh, the World War II, maybe in England. All right, Cynthia Teeter has got part of it right. Uh, so that's really good.
Yep, and the cords as well. All right, so I'm gonna stop it now because I could listen to it all night because it's beautiful. So what that is, is a hymn uh, that is called, I Vow to Thee My Country. So the next question is why might we be playing that particular hymn today? Any ideas? Veterans Day. Veterans Day. Yes. So it's Veterans Day, which in the UK is called Armistice Day or Remembrance Day. So it is uh, a traditional hymn that is sung on that day. And of course, uh, this past Sunday in England is what they call Remembrance Sunday, where in all of the churches in London, there are red poppies and uh, ceremonies. And today, uh, Queen Elizabeth II did a ceremony uh, laying the wreath of poppies uh, in central London. But there's even more that makes this song particularly appropriate. Um, part of it is that Lewis was a veteran. One of the things a lot of people don't know is that he was sent to the front line on his 19th birthday in the Battle of the Somme and uh, had a heroic action where he was wounded but captured a lot of German prisoners. Uh, but Lewis was uh, very loyal uh, in terms of his military duty and did what he could during World War II. But the music to this hymn is a uh, version of Gustav Holt's The Planets, the Jupiter theme. And that particular composition, The Planets, was one of Lewis's very favorite pieces of music. And the hymn itself, the words were written by uh, Sir Cecil Spring Rise after World War I. So it would have been a hymn that Lewis knew. Uh, it would have been one that had a lot of resonance for him. So good job, y'all figured that out. Uh, those of you that said our children's choir at St. Philip's has sung that, you were right about that as well. So a quick bit of context, uh, we've been talking about England in World War II and the BBC, uh, the fact that this was a time where the blitz was going on, uh, that there were hundreds of thousands of people that were homeless, people displaced, great uncertainty, fear of death, enormous stress, businesses out of business, restaurants and other gathering places closed, many churches not able to gather, many things similar uh, to the situation in which we find ourselves in this pandemic. Although we're not in a war, some of the effects are very similar. And the BBC had as part of its mission to do religious broadcasting, to encourage the nation. And they came to Lewis through the person of Jimmy Welch, uh, a pivotal link in this. Without Jimmy Welch, mere Christianity would never have happened. We'd never have this book. And Jimmy Welch uh, had gone the traditional route uh, in his role as head of religious broadcasting for the BBC and asked the Archbishop of Canterbury, the guy with the cool name, Cosmo Lang, uh, to do a talk. And he said it was utterly vapid and irrelevant. And so Jimmy Welch kind of went rogue. He went outside the box. He invited a layman to give an address about religion, which was, as we said, not done in the UK. And uh, Lewis came on and did these talks and they were a huge success. But we talked last week about how that one person's obedience ended up being a blessing to literally millions of people. And if you didn't hear that, I encourage you to get back uh, and listen. We also talked about the RAF, uh, the Royal Air Force ministry that Lewis did uh, that really helped him learn how to talk to the common man. And that is something that ended up being hugely useful. Um, Lewis did sacrificial service with the RAF, um, traveling three or four days a week, uh, going around and talking with these air crews, many of whom he spoke to and prayed with, and then they went off and they never came back. Uh, it was a very difficult ministry, and he spent a lot of time working with the chaplains there trying to encourage them as well. So that's kind of uh, to a quick bird's eye view with the bird flying very fast of where we've been. Tonight, what I want us to do is to look at the first preface. 
Uh, this is a little bit of a trick because I encourage you to maybe read the preface. Uh, but the preface you've got, if you've got a normal edition, is from 1952, and we're not talking about that one yet. But it will be very interesting for you if you read that, because the first preface is so very different. And the first preface, I think, is a key thing in understanding this whole book and why it is still so resonant with so many people today. And it's very short. It's very short. It's there on the screen. And I'm just going to read it out loud to you. So this was the uh, when the BBC first published the first section of these talks. It was under the title of Broadcast Talks, published during the war in 1942, which shows they thought it was important because there was a paper shortage, very hard to get anything published. But this is how Lewis started off the preface. It's not because I'm anybody in particular that I've been asked to tell you what Christians believe. In fact, it's just the opposite. The BBC have asked me, first of all, because I'm a layman and not a parson. And consequently, they thought I might understand the ordinary person's point of view a bit better. Secondly, I think they asked me because it was known that I'd been an atheist for many years and only became a Christian fairly recently. They thought that would mean I'd be able to see the difficulties, able to remember what Christianity looks like from the outside. So you see the long and the short of it is that I've been selected for this job just because I'm an amateur and not a professional and a beginner, not an old hand. Of course, this means that you may well ask what right I have to talk on the subject at all. Well, when I'd finished my scripts, I sent them round to various people who were professionals, to one Church of England theologian, one Roman Catholic, one Presbyterian, and one Methodist. The Church of England man and the Presbyterian agreed with the whole thing. The Roman Catholic and the Methodist agreed in the main but would have liked one or two places altered. So there you've got all the cards on the table. What I'm going to say isn't exactly what all these people would say, but the greater part of it is what all Christians agree on. One thing I can promise you, in spite of all the unfortunate differences between Christians, what they agree on is still something pretty big and pretty solid, big enough to blow any of us sky high if it happens to be true. So that is the original preface. It's not even 300 words long. And it is quite remarkable, uh, I think, in a lot of ways uh, in understanding what is going on with this book. And part of that is that Lewis realized on the front end of this project that connecting with the people who would be listening was key to earning the right to be heard. And he's quite deliberate in how he goes about inviting them in. It reminds me very much in the beginning of John's gospel, uh, you may remember that Jesus appears on the scene and some of John the Baptist's disciples come over to Jesus and they're sort of following him around. And he says, what are you seeking? And they say to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? Which has got to be one of the lamest responses in all of scripture. I'm sure they weren't actually really curious about where he was staying, but it was all they could think of at the time. But what Jesus says back to them is come and see. And that come and see approach characterizes Jesus's ministry to all sorts of people, the rich and powerful, the poor, the down and out, the sick, uh, come and see, uh, coming alongside and being invited in is Jesus's approach. And I think Lewis very deliberately does the same thing. He establishes a tone and an approach and a connection, which is really quite disarming. And he uses very few words. And I love this opening line. It's not because I'm anybody in particular that I've been asked to tell you what Christians believe. In fact, it's just the opposite. And this was radical because as we said, at this time, uh, it was only the experts that really talked to people about faith. 
And Lewis is determined to present himself as not an expert. And Lewis being a great fan of poetry, I'm sure may have had this line in mind from uh, one of my favorite Emily Dickinson poems. And that little poem just goes like this, I'm nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us, don't tell, they'd advertise you know, how dreary to be somebody, how public like a frog, to tell one's name the live long June to an admiring bog. And I think that's very much the, the sentiment that Lewis is trying to get across here, that he wants people to feel that he gets them. He understands where they're coming from and that he's on their team. He's on their side. Uh, it's sort of like that old show Cheers uh, where everybody knows your name and they're glad you came. He's trying to get that sort of sense across that this is not gonna be a big, uh, super intellectual, hard to follow uh, broadcast. And I love Harold Bloom's comment about this poem. He says, Dickinson seduces the reader into complicity with its writer. And I think that is exactly what Lewis is doing in this preface. He is seducing the reader into complicity with its writer in the very best sense of that. And so as you look at this and try to uh, dig down a little bit in what's going on in this preface, he really lays down straight off why he is a relatable and trustworthy guy. And I wanna just unpack this for a moment. So the first thing he's very careful to say is that he is a layman and not a parson. Now I can say this since I'm a clergyman, uh, but a lot of people think that clergymen are holier than thou, or they think they've got some sort of special connection to God and that the way that they live is so different from regular people that they're not really very relatable. Or they may think that they are just stuck on themselves and have big egos and are not really interested in the needs of the common person. So Lewis is very careful to say that he is a layman, that he is approachable, He's a regular guy, somebody you might see in the pub. He also talks about understanding of the ordinary person's point of view, which means he respects that. He's showing that he believes that people's opinions and thoughts about things matter and that he is, he's okay with that. He also is willing to be a little bit vulnerable and say he's been an atheist for many years and that he only recently became a Christian. We're gonna get back to that because that's an important point. But for people who didn't know what they believed, who were atheists or agnostics or had lost their faith, it was probably very interesting to hear someone say, well, that was exactly where I was, but I've had a journey since then that I'd like to tell you about. And I think it's a disarming way of coming at it. And he also says he sees the difficulties. He's right up front with the fact that not everything about Christianity makes sense right off the bat. And there's some things that are issues. And he also says that he can see what it looks like from the outside. Christians, even back in Lewis's day, had their own lingo, their own ways of doing things, uh, their own sort of Christian subculture, um, that for people on the outside of that, uh, particularly the kind of people who were the sorts of folks that Jesus spent his time with, people that were the down and out, the people on the edges of society, uh, very definitely felt outside Christianity and not welcomed in and not understood. And Lewis says, I understand that. I remember what that was like. He also says he was an amateur, not a professional. Uh, there was in, in the UK, particularly with the class structure, a whole distrust uh, of a lot of people in the so-called professional world. So being an amateur is a good thing, just as being a beginner, not an old hand is a good thing. And then you see Lewis actually showing how he is a beginner by saying he asked help from people who knew more. Uh, that's a, a real step of humility in that. And then he talks some about the subject matter that he's going to engage that he's gonna focus on what all agree on. Now, one of the things that uh, as Christians, we may not realize is that many people who are not Christians, even today and going back for centuries, 
have pointed out uh, quite strongly that one of their objections to the church is that Christians are always fighting each other, uh, that they always seem to have things that they disagree about and they get passionate about, and sometimes they kill the people on the other side. And so it's very easy to go uh, in that direction of focusing on all the things that separate different branches of Christianity. And Lewis says right off the bat, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to focus on what we have in common. And then he says, uh, this is my favorite part of the whole thing. He says, the subject matter is pretty big and pretty solid, that it is something uh, that is worth thinking about. And then the last line, it's big enough to blow any of us sky high if it happens to be true. Now that, my friends, is what is known as a hook. That is what is going to draw you in. Because if there's something that is so cool, so big, so solid, that it's going to blow you sky high if it happens to be true, then that is something worth paying attention to. And we have to remember, speaking in this kind of language, for Lewis, an effete Oxford Don who is used to a very, very intellectual way of doing things, this is just remarkable stuff. And it shows that Jimmy Welch was absolutely right uh, to go after Lewis for this, because Cosmo Lang and the other uh, clergy of the Church of England they would never have started a book or a broadcast talk with anything like this. They would have started off probably with some Latin and Greek quotations. Uh, they would have had a lot of words with five and six syllables, and it would not have been accessible for normal people. So the other thing that I think is quite remarkable about this preface is what's missing from it. We've talked a little bit about some of the things that are in it, but what's missing is really important. And it's important for us today, especially those of us who are Christians, because there are some huge lessons in here about how to engage a world that maybe is not very interested in God. You'll remember that Lewis said in some of his correspondence with Jimmy Welch on the front end of this, that he felt like that the situation in England was that about maybe a third of people in England were serious at some level about their Christian faith. There was another third who were maybe a little interested that had a little bit of background, but it had absolutely no impact on the way they lived their lives. And the other third couldn't care less and uh, might be an active rebellion against it. And that, my friends, is not so different from the world in which we find ourselves. And the interesting thing is Lewis's preface doesn't have in it any of the things that Christians today, the stereotype in our culture of Christians, uh, that's just missing totally from this. And we talked about this in previous classes that if you uh, go to the, the man on the street kind of interview, uh, pretty much anywhere around the United States and say, what are the first adjectives that come to your mind when you hear the word Christian, uh, the first adjective is judgmental and the second adjective is hypocritical. And that's a word that we don't like to hear because none of us like to think that we're judgmental. That must be those other Christians. That's the Baptist or the people at those other churches. We're not like that. But the fact of the matter is that we are all like that sometimes. And we need to realize how off-putting that is to people who know that Jesus said Christians are to be loving, that the mark of the Christian is to be love. And so when you look in this preface, there is no condescension. There's no condemnation of anyone. There's no superiority. There's no judgment of anyone. And there's no moralism. It reminds me so much of that old phrase um, from the evangelist D.T. Niles, that Christianity is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And that is very much Lewis's approach here. And it's one that we need to reclaim. Because when we come to share the gospel and we come with this attitude of humility, uh, it makes all the difference. 
And what you see sort of oozing out of the words of this preface, you see humility. You see someone who's thinking about how the people listening are gonna feel. You see Lewis talking about the kinds of questions that they might have about him. And you also see huge empathy being expressed uh, in the verbs there that he would understand, that he would see from their point of view, that he would remember about what it was like when he was on the other side, if you will. And the other thing that I think is so very interesting and really important is that he speaks as someone who has been changed. He says that he was an atheist and that he became a Christian. And we're sort of used to that in the church, but in the rest of the world, that is a very important thing because in England during this time period, much in the same way uh, that we see in our own country, especially in the Bible Belt, when you say somebody's a Christian, sometimes people think that just means that you're not Jewish. Uh, they, they see that it's just a, uh, a descriptor, but it doesn't involve a conversion. It doesn't mean a relationship with a living being. But Lewis is very clear right in this preface that he is speaking as someone who has been changed, that he became a Christian, that something happened to him that brought him out of his atheism and brought him to uh, claiming the name of Christian. The other thing that you see here is that he's speaking plainly. Uh, he is not beating around the bush. He's not using complicated sentence structure. He is speaking plainly uh, some of that skill that he learned when he was doing those RAF talks. And there, I mean, we could really go on and on and on about this, but uh, I just think the attitude that he shows here is hugely important. And there are a lot of lessons for us in it. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that a few years uh, after these talks, but before the publication of uh, Mere Christianity, Lewis got into a transatlantic uh, battle, if you will, uh, with Dr. Pittenger. Dr. Pittenger was a professor at General Theological Seminary in New York, which even then was a bastion of liberalism and very wonky theology. And so Dr. Pettinger had criticized Lewis and criticized the fact that he, was, um, he wasn't sufficiently intellectual in his writing about apologetics and that he was kind of an embarrassment. I mean, really, if you, you shouldn't touch these things unless you can talk about the hypostatic union and you can talk about uh, homoousios and all of these other terms that theologians use. And Lewis could not have disagreed more. And so he wrote a letter to the Christian Century, which was a big uh, liberal uh, Protestant magazine in the United States, talking about what he was doing. And it is very relevant to this preface that we just read and to Mere Christianity, which was about to be published at this point. So this is what Lewis said in his response to Dr. Pittenger. When I began writing apologetics, Christianity came before the great mass of my unbelieving fellow countrymen, either in the highly emotional form offered by revivalists or in the unintelligible language of highly cultured clergymen. Ouch. Uh, He's talking about Cosmo Lang, but he's also talking about a lot of people in the Church of England, the Anglicans like us. Uh, and he says, most men were reached by neither. My task was therefore simply that of a translator, one turning Christian doctrine into the vernacular, into language that unscholarly people would attend to and could understand. For this purpose, a style more guarded, more nuancé, finely or shaded, more rich in fruitful ambiguities would have been worse than useless. It would not only have failed to enlighten the common reader's understanding, it would have aroused his suspicion. If the real theologians, i.e. Dr. Pittenger and his ilk, if the real theologians had tackled this laborious work 
of translation about a hundred years ago when they began to lose touch with the people for whom Christ died, there would have been no place for me. And I love this little excerpt because I think it's a window into Lewis's heart. You see his passion for people that the church has left behind because of their embracing of theology and higher studies uh, to the exclusion of the life-saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, the clergy, the theologians, lost touch with the people, the people for whom Jesus died, and that the result of their losing touch is that there are there's a hundred years of water under the bridge where people have not heard the gospel preached to them in terms that they could understand. And that is why Lewis took up this work. Uh, and I think that that is, it's a word to the church today. Uh, not that we should be, Lewis is the last person to be anti-intellectual, the last person to say that your mind is not important and that you shouldn't seek to know deeply the doctrines of the church and to understand things like truth and beauty and goodness and all of that. But Lewis would also be the first to say, never let learning get in the way of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that Jesus used two very common images, the light of the world and the salt of the earth for a reason, that the gospel should be common. It should be approachable. It should be touchable. Uh, it should be examinable. And that part of our role as followers of Jesus is to bring that word to those around us. So uh, after that uh, initial talk preface, the, the first thing that we looked at, that was what Lewis said on the air in his very first broadcast talk. And then when they published that first preface, he changed it just a little bit. And this is kind of like one of those old highlights magazine things where you look and see uh, what's missing between the two pictures or what's been added. So I'm just going to let you look at this for a minute and see if you notice anything that was changed from the preface that we just looked at a minute ago. So I'll give you a clue. There are a couple of words that were changed and there are some things that were added that were not in the first one. So just take a look there uh, for a moment. See if you notice anything. All right, so uh, some of you have probably noticed uh, that there is uh, a whole part in there about the theories of the atonement um, that was not there before. Uh, there are also some word changes that are interesting. So uh, I want to go back to uh, looking at that. And one of the things that you'll see is that there aren't a lot of differences. He substituted clergyman for parson, uh, probably even more accurate for the British. Parson does sometimes mean a Church of England clergyman, but it also included a lot of the people from other denominations uh, and Lewis, I think, particularly is uh, not wanting people to think he's like a Church of England clergyman. He also substituted the word non-Christian for atheist. He wanted to be a little bit broader about that, realizing that there are, there's a range of people who have not arrived at Christian faith, but not all of them are atheists. He also identifies himself as a member of the Church of England, which he didn't before. And then he describes some feedback that he got from those experts and how he incorporated it. And then uh, very interestingly, and we'll talk about this when we get into the first section of the book, he acknowledges that the whole first series, uh, the first series of talks is really about philosophy and doesn't have anything to do um, per se with Christianity. So um, that is very interesting. So I wanna jump back for just a moment and see if I can, well, I'll see if I can get back to where I was going with that. Let's see here.
So um, these men that are on your screen are some of the experts that Lewis uh, sent the scripts to. And it's a little confusing because they are of very different ages, but that's more a function of where you can find photographs of them on the internet uh, than it is the fact that they were of very different ages. So the guy on the left, Dom Bede Griffiths, was actually one of Lewis's pupils early on, and Lewis mentored him, and it developed into one of the deepest friendships of Lewis's life, despite their age difference. And Dom Bede Griffiths um, studied for holy orders and was ordained as a priest in the Catholic Church. So he was the one uh, to whom Lewis sent uh, the manuscript for a review from the Catholic point of view. If you ever read C.S. Lewis's collected letters, which I so highly recommend to you, they are just wonderful to read, full of humor and theological insights. And it's also really easy to read because they're short. You can read one in five or 10 minutes and then close the book and pick it up the next day. Uh, but he had a lifelong correspondence with Dombey Griffiths and they're some of his most beautiful letters. The second person, the Church of England person, uh, was the Reverend Austin Farrer. And Austin Farrer was a fascinating man. Uh, most Church of England and Anglican theologians consider him to be the greatest mind, the greatest intellectual, the greatest theologian in Anglicanism of the past hundred years. He was the uh, chaplain at Trinity College in Oxford uh, and then went on to become the uh, master, the warden of Keeble College, which is the president of that college. He did a tremendous amount of writing, uh, but he was, uh, unlike the stereotype that Lewis puts forth in the preface, he was the most approachable, warm, winsome, loving man and an incredible preacher. Many people were converted under his preaching. So he was the one to whom Lewis sent the manuscript for the Church of England uh, viewpoint. And Austin Farrer and Lewis became very close over the years that Lewis was in Oxford. The Four Loves is actually dedicated to him. And uh, then the last guy, Eric Fenn, was Jimmy Welch's assistant at the BBC. He was an ordained Presbyterian minister. Um, all of these guys uh, were probably under 40 at the time that Lewis sent the manuscripts to be reviewed. There was also an RAF Methodist chaplain uh, named Reverend Dowell, uh, who seems to be lost in the sands of time. I couldn't find out much about him, but you know, it's just, I think, interesting to think that these are real people that Lewis consulted, and they were people that many would say Lewis knew more than they did. But Lewis, because of his humility, listened to what they had to say, um, considered it, and uh, as we'll see when we go through the book, actually made some alterations and things as a result of their input. So uh, there are a couple of things that I think we can learn from this preface that those of us who are Christians who are seeking to follow Jesus boldly, that we can uh, directly apply. One of the first of these is to take a good hard look in the mirror and think about how we are per perceived by non-believers. And indeed to think about, are we in relationship with any people who are not believers? You can't share the gospel if you don't ever run into anyone who's not a believer. And so part of what I think is important is to think about how we're perceived and to proactively seek to be winsome. And a lot of what you see in Lewis is his deep interest in others, his wanting to ask other people about their journey, to ask other people about their experience, about what mattered to them, about what brought them joy. Um, he asked incredibly great questions, which is why he had such a range of friendships. And so we can learn from that. We live in perhaps the most narcissistic culture ever. And even though those of us who are my age, uh, like to sort of look down and say, oh, those millennials, they're so narcissistic. I would just encourage you to look at your social media and see how many pictures of yourself you will find there. Uh, we've got a lot of narcissism going on and it may not be in pictures, but it may just be in 
wanting to talk about ourselves and play our little violin all the time about poor, poor, pitiful me. Uh, but I think it's important that we think about how we're perceived and we develop that radical other-centeredness that you see in Lewis. We can also seek to emulate the approach of humility and empathy, to seek understanding, to ask questions like, help me understand that. I don't, I don't know if I understand where you're coming from. Help me understand that. And learning to listen without interrupting. Building bridges. Uh, so often we are waiting for the world to build a bridge to the church. We're waiting for the people who are not Christians to seek us out and say, tell me about Jesus. But that's not usually the way that it works. They don't know that they need Jesus. And the person that they think Jesus is, they don't want to have anything to do with. So we've got to build those bridges. And we have to position ourselves as fellow seekers. That's what I love about the end of that, the hook, if you will, at the end of that preface, where Lewis says, this is something really big. It's something really solid. And if it's true, it will blow all of us sky high. And so the idea is that if we are seeking after that, if we can recapture our sense of wonder about the gospel and about what Jesus did for us, that will make all the difference in the world and our enthusiasm will overflow onto those around us. And then the next thing is to focus on what truly matters, the heart of the gospel rather than moralism. And this is such a hard thing because I think for many of us in the church, our hearts are grieved when we see people doing things that we know um, that the scriptures teach are wrong and that are going to be hurtful. But the problem with us is that we want to address those issues and look at people and you know, we probably don't quite so far saying, now, 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 stop that, that's wrong, that's bad. But the, the fact of the matter is we can come across um, as so concerned about morals and the way people are living that we neglect the heart of the gospel. And Jesus is such a wonderful example in this because you see Jesus engaging the person, even though he's fully aware of their sin, he wants to lead them through grace into the kingdom first. So that is something that I think we can learn from. There's a great story about Lewis in this regard where there was an Inklings meeting in Oxford at the pub. Uh, and when they came out, there was a man who was uh, a little bit disheveled, who was asking for money on the street. And the man approached Lewis and Lewis gave him a pound, which was a lot of money back then. And he was taken to task, I think it was by Tolkien afterwards, saying, Jack, you shouldn't have given that man that money. He'll probably go and spend it on drink. And Lewis looked at Tolkien and said, well, that's what I would have done with it too. And the, the idea is that Sometimes we look down our nose at people and we are not generous. We're not generous. We're not generous with the gospel. And then the next thing, and this is so important, do the groundwork. Lewis did an entire series of talks before he got anywhere near Christianity. He realized that people who don't think that they're sinners, who don't know what sin is, Salvation by grace isn't something that's interesting if you think you're a really great person and you uh, people should be lucky to know you because you're so awesome. Uh, preparing the groundwork is hugely important. Helping people understand what a worldview is. Helping people think about what's your life about? What's your meaning? What is the purpose of life? Uh, what does it mean to be human? All of these kinds of questions that uh, we're so busy and distracted that we don't ever talk about, but people are hungry to talk about these things. And Lewis did such an amazing job preparing the ground uh, that it enabled people to be able to hear the gospel. And this is where that whole idea of the power of story comes in. Uh, it's why it's great to read things like The Lord of the Rings or Narnia with people who are not believers 
because it gets around what Lewis called the watchful dragons of the mind and touches their heart and soul with the beauty and truth and goodness of the kingdom. And we're going to talk a lot more about the groundwork as we go through that first series. And then the last thing, and this is one of the reasons I think this book endures, is that meaning and purpose and experience are important. It's not just an intellectual question about whether Christianity is true. It's more importantly, and even more today than in Lewis's time, is Christianity true, not just intellectually, but experientially? Does it give meaning and purpose to life? Does it inform uh, the kinds of decisions that I need to make on a day-to-day -day basis? And when I embrace it, does it bring joy and satisfaction and meaning into my life? And so many apologetics works are strictly intellectual. They're just rational arguments. But the great gift of mere Christianity is it's full of all of these powerful analogies that help you understand about why the gospel is true uh, with a capital T and so very relevant to your day-to-day -day life and that when you embrace it, it changes everything. So this is one of the great gifts of this preface. It's amazing, just in 300 short words, uh, that you can pull all of that out of there. And I haven't even gone all the way down the rabbit hole with this thing. Uh, so there, I just think that there's so much that we can learn here uh, that can be a blessing to us and that can help us to reclaim some of that passion for the gospel that was so much a part of Lewis's life. So uh, we are going to get to the 1952 preface next week. Uh, it is magnificent and it is not really uh, anything like this first preface. So I commend to you to read that. And what I'd like to do is to go ahead and close uh, with this uh, quotation from the end of the book that I think really shows where Lewis's heart is and then we'll have a little discussion. So uh, let's say this together. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death, death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing, nothing that you have not given away will ever be really yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find him and with him everything else thrown in. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of this initial preface and for the window into Lewis's heart that we see there. And Lord, also for the way that it shows us the beauty of Jesus's approach to ministry, a self-giving, self-sacrificial, other-focused love that overflowed to those around him. Lord, we confess to you the pride and hypocrisy and impatience and selfishness of our lives. And we pray that you would turn our hearts uh, to be more like what we see in this preface, to reach out to those made in your image who so desperately need to know you. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, let's open things up if we want to try to do a little bit of discussion here. And we will uh, do that either through chat or you can do it um, by raising your hand, uh, however you would like to do that. Uh, any of those methods works for me. I will keep an eye on the chat if you have any uh, questions or comments that you wanna bring up, or you can just uh, unmute yourself uh, when you raise your hand.
It is also quite fine if you don't have any questions. Uh, one of the things that I will encourage you to do is to uh, make sure that you, you go back and reread some of these things. Uh, it may not seem that way to you, but I feel like I'm flying when I go through this stuff. So uh, there's a lot of richness that we're missing. Jane Gurley, yes. Brian, when did C.S. Lewis become a Christian? What year? And then in 1941, when he started writing their Christianity, how many years were there in between him becoming a and writing um, mere Christianity? Yes, that is such a great question. So Lewis uh, became a Christian. There's a little bit of uh, arguing about the exact date among theologians, but uh, pretty much most people would say 1931 or 1932. So he was uh, in his early 30s at that point, and he had checked out every other religion that there was. He had been an atheist, all of that, uh, was led to Christ by J.R.R. Tolkien uh, and Hugo Dyson one night on a long walk around Addison's Walk at Maudlin College. And Lewis was initially converted just to theism. Um, he said he felt the relentless approach of him whom he most sincerely desired not to meet, and that he finally knelt and prayed the most reluctant and dejected convert in all of England. Uh, but soon after that, uh, he was converted all the way to believing in Jesus, began to experience great joy. So this uh, invitation to speak uh, from Jimmy Welch uh, and to do these broadcast talks came in February of 1941. So he had been a Christian less than 10 years at the point that he uh, was doing this, which is really quite amazing to think about. Uh, but one of the beautiful things after he became a Christian is that he really was to use our modern lingo, discipled uh, by Tolkien and some other people in his circle. And also he was uh, so, uh, voracious in his reading and everything else that he uh, grew very quickly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a great question. Um, Thank you. I see another question. What was the response from uh, Dr. Pittenger uh, when he received Lewis's rebuttal? He was not amused. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Well, Pittenger and Lewis continued to uh, carry on kind of a battle uh, for a while. Um, and Pittenger was not uh, convinced by anything that Lewis had to say, uh, but it was uh, part of what Lewis did was to do a very uh, compelling critique of some of the methods that Dr. Pittenger uh, was using at General Seminary. And that probably didn't really help things either, but uh, I think Lewis was exactly right about that. Well, Brian, um, was this a public uh this criticism what precipitated this did Pittenger make a public critique yeah. and it so it was public it wasn't just a private letter that went to him yes, it was, it was an article in a journal um, okay. that was really part of part of what was so offensive about it I think was that usually in the UK um among academics or in these kinds of circles if you have a serious disagreement with someone you might engage in some conversation about that rather than just publishing a broadside. Uh, so that was that was probably part of the American brashness that uh, sometimes we're accused of uh, in our culture versus the UK. So that was uh, probably part of it. But Lewis, yeah, one of the things he had a number of people that he profoundly disagreed with, um, that he sparred with intellectually, and that he was very very close to. Uh, in fact, there was a professor at Cambridge um, that they had a lot of back and forth about a lot of things and never agreed. Uh, but the guy from Cambridge, when Lewis died, mourned his death and said Lewis was the best kind of uh, opponent to have because he was so intellectually honest. Um, he was so uh, polite and caring and civil uh, in all of his dialogue. So yeah, that's a great question. Um, another question I'm seeing from the records, why is the 1952 preface so much longer? Um, yes, you're right. It is way longer. 
Uh, so we probably won't even be able to finish it next week because I'll probably get carried away. Uh, but one of the things about the preface that is, I think, so beautiful uh, in the longer one is that Lewis uses it to instruct people about how uh, to interpret what mere Christianity means and what it doesn't mean and how to think about what Christian means and what it doesn't mean and to really invite people again in that beautiful come and see mode uh, into the deep Christian faith. And there's a beautiful metaphor um, that I'll share a little bit tonight. I don't want to steal the thunder from next week, but uh, one of the metaphors is that he had the hallway, and I see Chris is just putting this up, so she's anticipating me. Uh, the hallway, he says, mere Christianity is a hallway. It's a beautiful hallway that you enter into when you begin to uh, embrace and you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. But he said, in the hallway, there are all of these different doors, and the doors are Catholicism, Anglicanism, Presbyterian, you know, all of those things. And he said, the hall is beautiful, and you can't get to the doorways without being in the hall. But he said, when you enter through the door, that's where the beautiful food and fellowship and the warm fire and the great conversation occur. And so he's really encouraging people to embrace um, a denomination to embrace a church and to be really involved in that, but to choose the one that they believe most reflects uh, what they believe that the church should be about. So that's a little uh, foretaste of uh, what's coming in that preface. Um, I would commend that preface to you. Uh, again, one of the things that, uh, and part of the reason that we're going so slowly here is that we live in a culture where we don't do things very deliberately. We like to rush in and we like to try to get, get the, the gist of something and think that we've got it. We like to read the internet summary uh, rather than reading the long article. And I think when you do that with mere Christianity, you just shortchange yourself so much. And that when you see what's in this preface, uh, that we looked at tonight, when you know the backstory about Jimmy Welch, when you know the backstory about the BBC and the war, and that Lewis is literally coming into London on a train where he sees flames all around him, uh, all of those kinds of things, uh, and is climbing over sandbags to get to the studio to do the recordings, it just gives you a whole different flavor for it. So, uh, I hope that's been enough to whet your appetite a little bit for next week. And I, I really, I'm so excited about getting to chapter one. Uh, we will get there. Uh, I promise we won't get there next week, but we will get there. Uh, I would also really encourage you, invite your friends. Uh, one of the great things about Zoom is we can have really as many people as we like. And uh, if you think that it might be a blessing to someone, please invite them along. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, I am delighted to have been with you all and uh, be on the lookout for your email with some links and some more materials for snorkeling and scuba diving. And I will look forward to seeing you next time. God bless you.